the thing that struck me is your story comes at this struggle for change in the community and that change is hard for people, for people everywhere. Well, the first thing that pops into my mind is that yes, change is hard. And I came in with an idea of rotational grazing for the Fulani. I came in with the idea of education for Fulani children. But here's the thing. All of the Fulani that I have met in many different corners of Nigeria have embraced that change. And so this kidnapping, it, it's not a general feeling that we don't want change and let's get rid of this, this woman and her projects. No, this was an evil man who did not want the Fulani children and the Fulani families to enjoy an education. So you've brought us here to this school, Hope Academy, where you were where you were kidnapped. Mm -hmm. What happened that morning? What were you doing? Okay. Yeah. So I've been very much involved with opening grazing reserves in Nigeria. I've been working with Governor Wada here in Lokoja, in Kogi State, um, on opening a grazing reserve. But we only had 100 hectares of land. And so I had gone and requested that the governor help us with 900 additional hectares, and he agreed. And Janet and Jacob and I were standing in the shade of the trees close to the church here, and just so happy talking, you know, without a, a, a worry in the world. We were just thrilled. It was like the pinnacle of, of success for us that we were getting this extra land. So all of a sudden, as we were standing there talking, I heard gunshots and I saw men running toward me and I just sort of froze. And they began to drag me over toward the wall. The man who was on the right-hand side struck me hard across the face. He said to me, this is the day that you're going to die. And they threw me over the wall. And we walked and walked and walked and they were pushing me and pulling me. I couldn't actually comprehend what was happening. I felt this terrible despair. Oh God, oh God, save me. I just kept saying, save me, save me. At a certain point in time, they gave me a little sip of, of water from one of their water bottles. And during that interval, I turned to the man on my right, who appeared to be the, the leader of this gang. And I said to him, what's your name? And he answered me, he said, I'm Alhaji Ismaila. And I said to him, I'm Reverend Phyllis. And something happened in that moment that that we connected. And then he looked down and saw that I was uh, short one shoe, and he took off one of his sandals and put it on my foot. And then we continued to walk. I was born and raised in Mozambique uh, on a remote mission station called Inyamashapu. And it was just myself and my two sisters on that station that were white children. We grew up with African children. The time that I was growing up, Mozambique was a Portuguese colony, and there were very strict rules on how white missionaries could behave. They weren't 
allowed to have any black people in their house unless they were servants. So I grew up with these African children, but with a horrible sense of injustice. It wasn't fair. I can remember so many times, you know, telling my mom and dad, this isn't fair, it's not right. And they would say, we don't like it either, but there's nothing we can do about it. If we want to stay in Mozambique, we have to follow the rules. So when I finished uh, the eighth grade, I was sent to Johannesburg to live with a missionary family and go to a local public school. This was at the height of apartheid. Segregation was the rule of the day. The school was only white children. I, I witnessed things as a 12-year-old girl that I should never, ever have seen, things that are still with me today. I've seen, I, was, I saw men being beaten and thrown into the street. I witnessed a woman being raped. Well, one day by chance, I met a, a young girl my age who was the daughter of a cook. And one day she invited me to her house. And very many times, two or three times a week, we would ride our bikes to her house. I felt more comfortable at her house than I did where I was living with this missionary family. Well, unfortunately, it was discovered one day that I was hanging out with this black child. And that was against the rules. And so I was sent immediately to a boarding school in Zimbabwe. So that was my life growing up. And th that sense of injustice and, and the, the fact that why, why are we as white people better than people with brown skin or black skin? It, it just wasn't right. It didn't feel right. And so I've always had this desire to help people who have been pushed away, you know, people who have been maltreated. I've had that strong desire and just it's the way I, I grew up and I was just shaped this way. So when I came to Nigeria and I met the Fulani, I'll never forget the day that that cattle drive came through the village. And these beautiful Fulani people were following the cattle. I was standing by a Nigerian man and I asked him, I said, who are these beautiful people? I've never seen these people before. And he looked at me and he said, oh, forget about them. Those are the Fulani. They bring their cows down here into our state. They spoil our crops. These people live in the bush with their animals. They're dirty, they're dangerous. They don't even speak our language. And they're Muslims. Whatever you do, stay away from them. And I knew at that moment that I needed to come close to the Fulani. Because in that moment, I felt the same indignation that I had felt as a child. When I was told by my parents, you cannot bring these children into our house because their skin is a different color than ours. We Fulani, we pity cow, we love cow. After our life is cow, important for us. Number one, you feed your children, you feed your brothers, you marry, you do everything is cow do for you, and cow give you milk, you take milk, take everything you want, sell it by clothes. If God no one full and cry for hungry. God no one full and cry for where they live in. Any place their cow sleep, full and can go sleep, enjoy. Now he make we know thing we like to come out us near cow. To see the Fulani are very traditional people. They tend to follow the the vegetation, the, you know, and uh, in the process, the full and the cattle destroy people's farmlands and their produce. It's unintentionally, of course, you know, cattle they, they just move. They don't care whether it's yams or cassava or corn. 
they destroy it. For them, it's food. So, and this brought a lot of conflict between farmers and the Fulani cattle rearers. Okay, somebody no come near, no know us, he say we a bat. Why? Now in them fear the thing they no see. They fear the thing they no know. And Phyllis go in, know the truth, see, sleep for inside bush with us. We did together with him. We chop together, we drink together. And the Fulani have been controlled by other tribes for a long time. It's time for that to stop. It's time for the Fulani children to have a chance. So I think the Fulani need, need a champion. Mogodia is their champion. A champion is somebody who stands up for the right of other people. You are standing up for the rights of your people, and I will join you in that. I will stand up for the rights of the Fulani. Now, the, the, the time come, every place in a city, every place in a farm. Now we want a change. How we get a grazing area, how we come get a bush, the place we pass with our cow. We stay one place. How our children educate, we like it. You can turn away. You can say, no, God, I'm. I, that's not interesting to me. I don't want to do that. Or you can say, sure, I'm willing to do it and go that path. There was no hesitation for me. I mean, I knew that this was something that, that I could do with, with Mogodi. And that's why we just went and did it. Our whole purpose in this was to find a way to have peace between the herdsmen and the farmers. How to achieve that peace? When you have C and H together, it makes it says So in our schools, we have farmer's children and Fulani children sitting together, eating together, playing together, learning together. Erosion is the washing away of the Because our hope is that as they grow up and become adults, that this, this sense of togetherness will continue. We're all equal. We're all human beings together in God's country here. Kawe chike na sainami uwaya. Ini rajo anotie. Sai uwi ambimi oko boyanton. Sai uwi benangi filis. Do what you can happen filis. What begari kochi filis. Say the name me born no naru me mai de matujo ano na. Daga no umoi me ya. Me daraki daga don. Dar ne ka wala to am. Daga ton umoi me ham me don. Daga baelsa kuchu me mota me daraki ko ina say loko ja say imor. It was shocking. How can such a good person be kidnapped? I mean, she's there. She's helping people. She's sacrificing her comfort. She's sacrificing her time and energy and ideas to help our people. How will any human being go and kidnap her? Ten years. Since I know Phyllis, he might. How he loved my people. He loved Fulani. He loved people for every place. No anybody I love like I love Fulani. Now I tell you, after my father, my mother, is Phyllis. It was a moment of confusion. People are crying. And all I know, the Bible says, call upon me in the time of trouble, and I will deliver you. We have to go back to God immediately. And sir, we have one particular hymn we're singing often and often that period. I must take Jesus all my trials. 
Jesus alone, if Jesus alone can help me. That was the only hymn we were singing all the time. And each time we come together, we sing the hymn and we began to cry unto God that he can deliver us. Mm. I must tell Jesus, mm. so that the Jesus, I cannot bear my body alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus. Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. <laughs> Amen. It was about six o'clock in the evening as the sun was going down that we finally began to stop. And I stumbled and tripped and I fell. And I fell inside down the, this little hill into the ravine. And I landed on my face. And they said, you can rest there. And so it was like I was so stressed, so stressed out that I, I threw up. And I just lay there with my, my face in my vomit and in the dirt. And I just, I've never felt such despair. I, I, I could see myself as my kidnappers saw me, wretched, despicable, a victim. And it struck me then that if I ever wanted to get through this thing alive, I was going to have to take control of myself. I couldn't allow myself to have this mentality of being a victim. And so at that moment, I, I sat up and I was wearing a scarf, so I took the scarf and I cleaned my face as best I could, found a place to sit down on a rock, and I waited there to have the kidnappers come and talk to me. I was sitting there for a long time. Nobody came. It was very quiet in the bush. And it was so quiet, I thought, maybe the kidnappers have left. I'm here alone. I'd be a fool not to try to escape. And so I stood up really slowly, and I started walking toward the right, and immediately the kidnappers just appeared. So that's when Ismaila stood over me, and he was just standing there looking around, and I said, Ismaila, what's the plan? What's the plan now? And he said, somebody has hired us to kidnap and kill you. So I talked to Ismaila. I said, Ismaila, you don't want to kill me. I said, I'm an old woman, probably the age of your mother. Would you like it if somebody kidnapped your mother? Would you be happy if somebody killed your mother? He said, no, I wouldn't be happy. I wouldn't like that. I said, are you married? He said, yes. I said, one wife or two? And he laughed, you know, and I laughed. He said, one wife only, one wife is all I can handle. And then he kind of pulled himself together and he said, you know, you are the age of my mom. He said, if you were a man, I could kill you. But you are the age of my mom. And so I want to promise you, I will not touch you. And I will not allow my men to touch you. And tomorrow I will take you home. And from that time on, he started to call me mommy. He called me mommy the whole time. It was around two o'clock or three o'clock in the morning and Ismaila, he struck the ground four times with his hand and it, it was apparently some kind of signal because all of the kidnappers started to move around and sit up and they were rubbing their eyes and I sat up too and then Ismaila came over and he said get up we're going now so I said Ismaila, are you taking me home now he said yes I'm taking you home I was so naive, you know, I actually believed him that he was going to take me back. We walked down the ravine and came to that sandy patch where I was hoping to get water. I was so thirsty. We walked a little farther and he said, I'm going to dig here for water. But they only let me like take about two handfuls of water myself. They wouldn't give me any more than that. 
we drove for a little ways and there was a path. And I had this great surge of hope that we were going back to Emiwoto. But after a certain point, the driver turned around and went back and went into the bushes and into the wilderness. And eventually, we entered this clearing and the smell of blood assailed me at that moment. My spirit just told me, this is a bad place. I was shaking, trembling, and it was, it was a situation that was out of my control. All I could think about is, this is not right. To die at the hands of a witch doctor who's going to use her body parts to make medicine for the evil one. If I die, I should die to honor, to honor Jesus. Suddenly, one of the little boys stood up and he came over to us and he had a long knife in his hand and he, he handed it over to Ismaila. He said, Ismaila, see the knife. And Ismaila wouldn't touch it. He said, put it down. And I realized that, that Ismaila was supposed to use that knife to kill me. But I didn't want to die. So I looked at Ismaila and I said, Ismaila, I know you don't want to kill me. Well, he wouldn't look at me. He just kept looking out, you know, into the distance. I knew that he, he was ashamed. And I said, Ismaila, I think that this witch doctor um, is going to pay you for my body, correct? You know, my family, my people will pay you more for me alive than this witch doctor would pay for me dead. And you know, his face just brightened up. It was like, wow, there's a solution. We traveled again many kilometers and every so often the kidnappers would stop and look for for a cell phone network. So we would keep going. They would stop. They would climb up on top of a hill. They would try to find network. No network, come down, keep going. Finally, they found a place where there was some cell phone coverage. And the first thing Ismaila did was he, he took my cell phone and brought it over to me. And he said, I want you to call somebody about the ransom. And so I scrolled through the contacts and I thought, let me call Janet Aliaba because she always has phones in her hand or in her bag. <laughs> that's true. That's true. And, but even before I could um, touch your number, Ismaila stopped me feet and he said, don't tell anybody where we are. If you have to tell people that we are calling from town, we're not calling from bush. If you tell people that you are calling them from the bush, very bad things will happen to you. You hear me? You get me? I said, I hear you, I get you. So it was when I heard your voice, I screamed from here and a lot of crowd of people were there. So it was then, uh, what happened, what happened? <laughs> and Anna started telling them, she's alive, she has called me. She's alive, she has called. The pressure was on to make the phone calls to get money for my ransom. But time went by and no answers came. All of them were just, were just coming at me, money, money, money. That's what they wanted. And I felt really, really scared and really alone out there. I didn't know what to do. The bee shared the bee, people, and we shared it then. The gala. Wala not un hebira de Dagaha Allah wat ip gati kinapin Phyllis Joni Wala not un hebra chet to wara un sora uro ango ni um un sora na i an igomi un how ta chebe de un yaga Allah un belo Phyllis un yopa Phyllis seba wa de bi uro ya garu mi makaran ta ni jeti mi makaran sa ta i garu mi thau mi mi dari tan ha esex ha dan sa dai.
Wadaniyan tambayo yijifu. Wananai. Kogu otami anda. Impe. Dimu onangaya. Taka do ya to wat munga. Wat munga. Musa alin karfi poko. Sa uya dimu. Taka do ngaja munga wala. Sa ito. Kuda no miso maa isho ito yimu. Dimi to joni. Sainu e tu wat tat mheba. Do ya filis. We had the police, the state security, we had the army, we had civil defense, and all of us were coordinating to ensure that she didn't come to harm. On that day in the afternoon, Ismaila got a phone call. And I could tell that he was trying to talk to the person but having difficulty understanding him. So Ismaila brought the phone over to me and gave me the phone. So I said, hello. And a man answered and said, hello, is this Phyllis? I said, yes, this is Phyllis. And I said, who is this? He said, my name is Robert and I have a message for you. We want to tell you that thousands of people are praying for you around the world. Robert told Ismaila that money would come but it wasn't all going to come at once because the Nigerian government would confiscate any money that came that they thought would be given to terrorists. Every day, Robert would call and he would say, this is how much money we have now. Would your Olga accept it? And Ismaila would go and call his Olga, and the Olga would not accept it. And it was pretty frightening. Money, money, money. I tried to explain to Ismaila, it's only been one week, and the money is coming little by little by little. You have to be patient. Monday afternoon, Ismaila came down. He had a bowl of rice. And I told him, I can't eat. I was just feeling sick to my stomach of fear. And he said, no, mommy, you have to eat. And I said, I just can't eat this. He said, mommy, at least three bites. Take three bites. And he watched me while I took three bites of rice. And then as we were sitting there, all of a sudden, into the clearing came a group of men who had never been there before. And I knew that these were Olga's boys that were coming to settle me. We just sat there on the ground and watched them. One, one of them came over to where we were. And he sat down right next to me, right between me and Ismaila. And he was wearing a gas mask. He was a very frightening looking guy. And he opened his mouth and the first thing he said was, have you had your dinner? So I, I kind of smiled and I said, yes, I've, I've eaten, thank you. And we just went on and, and had a discussion. He went to the point of, um, in Nigeria, there's no jobs, no work for anyone, no work, no jobs. And he was complaining and going on and on. And I said that once this whole ordeal was over, if he was interested, that I would be happy to have him come and work with me. I would give him work to do. And all of a sudden, he just burst into tears. And then he started to say, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry for the things that I've done. Please forgive me. And I said, I forgive you. And God forgives you too. And I reached out and held his hand and I prayed for him that God would forgive him and that he would, you know, take a different path in his life. And after a while he got up and he went back into the bushes behind me and I could hear him blowing his nose and wiping his face. The next day was Wednesday 
and the Oga accepted the amount of ransom that was offered to him. The hours went by and nobody came. Nobody came all day long until around five o'clock in the evening, Ismaila came running down the, the trail. Snake and the other kidnappers had reached the point, the place where they were going to do the, the exchange. And that was when I realized that they were not going to exchange me at all. And I was here. So Snake told Ismaila where they were waiting for the money. And I knew the place. I told him to go down toward Ajakuta, to do the second roundabout, to go through the village, past the market, and up into these unoccupied houses. Robert said, I'm not comfortable with this. It's getting dark. And so I told that to Ismaila. And Ismaila agreed with Robert. And I could hear Snake shouting on the phone. I could tell that he was not happy about this. Snake was just the worst. He had he he never wore a shirt. He had a black raincoat that he wore, and he had he had knives in his belt. All of a sudden, there was Snake and his men, and Snake was saying, "You made us suffer. You made us walk all that way for nothing. Now we're going to make you suffer." And I was pulling myself back in the rock and and you know trying to protect myself. And all of a sudden, Ismaila was there and he came and stood between me and Snake, and he said, stand up, mommy. So I stood up again behind Ismaila. And all of a sudden, as I was standing behind Ismaila, another second man came and stood shoulder to shoulder with Ismaila, protecting me against Snake. And it was gas mask guy. As it was getting light, Snake and his men got up and took off into the bush to the second location. So we waited. Then the phone rang again, and it was Robert. Don't panic, Phyllis, but I have very bad news for you. And he said, police have shown up. They're surrounding the van. In the meantime, Snake had phoned Ismaila, and he was screaming at Ismaila that they had been lured into a trap and that Ismaila should kill me and just get it over with. So Robert called the FBI. The FBI called the, uh, the U.S. Embassy in Abuja. The U.S. Embassy called the chief of police who called his men who were around the van and told them to leave. And they left. And before you know it, we get another phone call from Snake. And Ismaila's face just broke into this big smile. And he said, we've got the money, we've got the money. And oh, I can't tell you of the great relief that we all felt. It was amazing. For somebody to be tortured, for somebody to be denied, for somebody to spend I was afraid that anybody I might approach could be somebody who would harm me even more. And then suddenly, in the distance, I saw a man walking toward me, and he was pushing a wheelbarrow, and there were two small children by his side. So I thought to myself, here is somebody who is a family man. Surely he won't hurt me. And so I went up to the man, and I said, please, can you show me the way to the main road. So the man looked at me and looked at me 
and suddenly he had a big smile on his face and he reached out and he grabbed my hand and he said, congratulations, yes. congratulations, I recognize you. We've been praying for you at my church. He said, my name is Brother Moses and I am the usher at the Redeemed Christian Church of God. He said, come, come, come with me, I will take you to our church. And I began to cry like a baby. I was just crying and crying and crying. When the FBI was taking me out of Nigeria to fly me back to Seattle, they took me through the airport to Abuja. We didn't have to wait for any, you know, red tape or tickets or anything. We just marched through the airport with FBI agents on either side. And as we walked along, one Muslim man saw us and came over to me. And he said, I just want you to know that when you were kidnapped, my mosque, we prayed for you while you were kidnapped. I just want you to know. And I thanked him. And it really, really touched me. When I went back and I was so scared, I prayed to God, Lord, I said, I want to go back to Nigeria, but I'm afraid. Then I began writing the story. And and I got to the point of the story where the kidnappers took me to the witch doctor's den. And boy, I just fell apart. You know? It was like a huge boulder was just in my chest and in my stomach. I couldn't hardly breathe or eat. The fear and the anxiety just overtook me. And I couldn't sleep at night. It was just, it was horrible. And that Easter Sunday morning, there was a television in my room. I turned it on and there was a Easter Sunday morning service in an African-American church and the choir was singing. I just connected with them immediately. And then the pastor came and began to preach. And he preached about the women who were walking on Easter Sunday morning to Jesus' tomb. And they were talking among themselves, saying, we want to put lotions on Jesus' body, but who will roll away the stone so that we can enter the tomb? And the whole message of the pastor that day was, whatever stone you have in your life that's blocking your joy, or blocking your, your ministry, your purpose in life, God will roll away that stone. Just ask him. God will roll away the stone. And I knew that God was speaking to me because I had that huge stone that was stopping my joy and blocking my purpose here in Nigeria. And I knew God was talking to me and I was just so excited and happy. I just put my hands up and I was, you know, I was just praising God and that stone rolled away and I came back. Schools for Africa, Bobby Grazing Reserve, Mariga Local Government Area, Niger State. Director of Schools for Africa, Reverend Philly Soto. Distinguished guests, able teachers, and my co pupils of Schools for Africa. A very good time to everyone present here. My name is Bello Bello. From primary two, it is an honor to wear I mean, 95% of the people I know would have packed their bags and left Nigeria. But she refused. She said, look, I have a mission. I'm, I know I'm making a positive impact on people's life. I am saying it. And so, when you are seeing such impact of your work, I understand why she stayed. But abandoning the benefit to others, from the work she's doing, is what she couldn't live with. Thank you one, thank you all. God bless Good for Africa, God bless Niger State, and God bless Federal Republic of Nigeria. I learned, I learned many something. 
you trust God. Because Phyllis trusts God. Holy God. I learned this one from Phyllis. Because he tell me that thing. I see. She go, she kidnap. Go for him place. Come back for that place, the same place he kidnap. He say no problem. He can do the work. He say he do. I don't learn. Thank you. So can you tell me one more time uh, why you wanted to have a film made of this story? I want to encourage people. I think it's an important story for people to hear because surely things will happen in their lives too. But it shouldn't be the end for them. It should just maybe be a little bump in the road, you know, they get through it and they keep going forward. I am a happy person now because I came back. I cannot even tell you how happy I am. I love being here. Right here is where I was kidnapped. Right here is where gunshots rang out and men in hoods came over and grabbed me and took me and threw me over the wall. But I can stand here and, and just, I just feel happy, you know? This is my place. I'm supposed to be here, I know that. And that's the story that people need to hear. You know, it, it took me some time to, to get the courage to even get the phone numbers that Robert had used. I called and called and called, nobody answered. But one day I got a phone call back from that number and it was Ismaila. And when he answered the phone, I said, is this Ismaila? He said, I'm the one. I said, this is mommy. And I said, Ismaila, I just, I'm calling to say thank you to you for being kind to me in the bush and for not allowing anyone to hurt me. And I said to him also, I want to say that I forgive you for all, for all the bad things that happened. And so he said to me, I love you, mommy. I said, I love you too, Ismaila.